Welcome, everybody. I'm Ann Mason, a member of the program committee for the National Railway Historical Society's DC chapter. And I'm your host for tonight's event. And I'm joined by Darren Goldsmith and Jim Perry, who will be assisting me. Our chapter's mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. We accomplish this mission through a variety of programs, including sponsoring a rail camp for a high school student, operating three rail cars, including the two in cars and our beloved 1923 Pullman, the Dover Harbor. We maintain a railroad library at Bowie Tower, Maryland, and we publish our monthly newsletter, The Timetable. Another way we fulfill our mission is by offering free public programs including tonight's. Tonight, we are joined by Carl Atencio, who will introduce the new US-based operations of the Rocky Mountaineer, a luxury train operator located in British Columbia, Canada. And I can attest that the images Carl are going to show tonight will make your, get out your calendar to see when you might be able to fit in a ride into your vacation schedule. And Carl's colleague, Joanne Taylor, business manager for the Rocky Mountaineer, is here tonight. And she can help you understand the client experience when traveling on the Rocky Mountaineer. Now, a little bit more about Carl. He is superintendent of operations and mechanical at the American Rocky Mountaineer, which means he has the primary responsibility of the day-to-day -day operations of the railroad, including a direct oversight for train operations, the equipment and management, and while supporting other departments, such as guest experience, destinations, and onboard operations. Prior to his employment at American Rocky Mountaineer, Carl worked for several other railroads, including working as a chief mechanical officer at Denver Transit Operations, and as an operations and maintenance contractor for RTD Denver Commuter Rail. Now, you think he's busy, but we're not done. Carl's an active member of the American Public Transit Association, and he sits on several committees, including the Mechanical Passenger Rail Equipment Safety Standards Committee and the Rolling Stock Equipment Technical Forum, of which he is chair. And in 2020, he was selected as the association's emerging leader for the class of 2020. So let's settle in and let Carl and Joanne take us on a magical journey from Denver to Mohab on the Rocky Mountaineer. Now, Carl, we're just ready for your all aboard signal. All aboard. Thank you for that introduction, Ann. Um, I also want to take the, before we get started, I want to take the time to thank uh, Scarlett Wirt. Um, and uh, Joanne Taylor for uh, uh, agreeing to last minute join me this evening to do this presentation, uh, as well as to thank all the uh, DC chapter of the uh, National Rail Historic Society for the chance and opportunity to represent uh, Peter Armstrong and the entire Rocky Mountaineer family. Uh, 2021 uh, was an exciting uh, year for me personally as well for Rocky Mountaineer. Uh, so what we're going to be doing this evening is I'm going to be taking you and presenting you through uh, our journey on the startup of their newest route, uh, Rockies to the Red Rocks, or as we call it, RTR. First off, I want to explain, you know, what is Rocky Mountaineer? I know a lot of people have uh, heard of Rocky Mountaineer before, um, but Rocky Mountaineer is uh, what we provide is luxury train journeys. And uh, not only are they luxury train journeys, but our main purpose of them is to showcase spectacular scenery. Um, and spacious glass dome coaches. So that's kind of our, our icon as a company is the, is the type of scenery that we take you through. And then, you know, the, the, the large grand windows that we allow you to see through. Um, while on that journey, you're guaranteed to um, experience uh, delicious cuisine, uh, a very attentive service and a friendly and social atmosphere on board with the, uh, with, you know, the, the guests that are on board as well as our team members that are on board. All of our journeys are two to three days long. Uh, the train only travels in the daylight. So unlike Amtrak, 
uh, even though we go interstate and we are very long journeys, uh, we do not have sleeper cars on our train. The way that the product works is the, um, you know, because we want to highlight that scenic uh, journey is we only travel in daylight and the, and we have uh, our destinations, but we also use midpoint destinations where we partner with hotels. And uh, when we get there, you'd get off the train, you would be assigned a hotel, uh, you'd have a really restful night in a hotel. And then on the next day, you're back on the train where we would take you to your uh, final destination, or if it's a three day trip to the next destination to get on to the, to the final destination. And, and this product is so uh, we want to ensure that the guests do not miss uh, a moment of the, um, of the scenery that, that uh, our train goes through. So a little bit of uh, history here. Sorry, there's a leg. In, the, uh, in Rocky Mountaineer, um, Rocky Mountaineer is an iconic Canadian company. Uh, when you talk with any Canadian, uh, they're probably sure to know about Rocky Mountaineer. Uh, here in a few years, we are, it is our hope that we're you know, a very iconic American company and that we're widely known in America as well. Uh, for Canada, though, we're, why we're iconic or widely known is we've been operating in Canada for about 32, uh, 32 years now, uh, doing uh, world-renowned train journeys between Vancouver and, the, and other remaining points in the Canadian Rockies. The company was founded in 1990 by Peter Armstrong. And since then, the company has grown from uh, what he started with was what a, a few traditional rail cars to over 70 pieces of rolling stock, which we now, which the company now owns and operates today. Um, and one great thing about Rocky Mountain there that I truly appreciate, uh, especially last year as he was committed, but uh, Peter is still uh, our owner. Uh, he's still fully committed to the success of the business uh, and so much that he actually spearheaded the uh, U.S. expansion um, over the last year in 21. So he had, you know, a great deal of, of you know, on the ground effort uh, that he was with the team on implementing the Rockies to the Red Rocks route. So just to give you a little bit of understanding of what the routes look like in Canada, um, like I said, in, in 1989, uh, the, the rail route was privatized by the Canadian government. So similar to, uh, you know, the National uh, passenger Rail Corporation forming here, which is commonly known as Amtrak, when um, the government formed Amtrak, the, the similar situation happened in Canada. And when that happened, there were some routes that were available for, uh, you know, for, that were up for grabs for train travel. And so uh, Peter saw that. Peter has a very entrepreneurial spirit, and he saw that as an opportunity uh, for the business. Um, and that's what he's done is over the 30 years, uh, the company has become one of the most iconic tourist experiences in Canada. Um, on 2020, we were on track for a record breaking year uh, with over 100,000 guests uh, that were, you know, expected uh, to travel on the uh, three trains within Canada. And uh, just to explain the, the three routes there. So you can see <clears throat> all the three routes come out of uh, are based out of Vancouver. Uh, the first uh, route that was our, our most iconic route in the first route uh, was what we call our first passage to the west, which is the uh, maroon uh, line there that goes from Vancouver to Kamloops and then over to Lake Louise and, and Banff. Um, and then the other route that uh, shares part of that journey with, to Kamloops is what we call our, um, our uh, journey through the clouds. Uh, which at Kamloops, the train splits and then uh, carries on into Jasper. And then uh, I would say the latest route, other than the RTR, is what we call the RGR, which is the Rainforest to Gold Rush, um, which is a three-day route um, that actually goes from Vancouver to Whistler, onto Cornell, um, and then on to Jasper as well. The journey through the clouds and the uh, first passage to the west are a two-day route, just like the uh, Rockies to the Red Rocks. So a um, little bit about the uh, kind of expanding on the company's history. Um, 1990, you know, 89 when it was privatized, uh, 1990 was when, uh, you know, Peter founded the business and Rocky Mountaineer uh, operated its first season. Um, when they operated its first season, it did so with what we referred to as what we call red, uh, a red leaf service, uh, which is older, you know, CN uh, Canadian national coach cars. And 1995 um, was when we received our first uh, uh, gold leaf cars, um, which are you know really iconic to Rocky Mountaineer. They're a bi-level 
dome car, and I'll, I'll go into the equipment uh, details a little bit later. Uh, but we, we featured our first Cold Leap service back in 1995. Um, and then in 1999, uh, you know, we had a, a record break for the longest passenger train at 41 cars. Um, we, the, our previous record was also held by Rocky Mountain Air at 37 cars. And then in 2006, uh, we launched Rainforest to the Gold Rush route. Uh, 2007, uh, we brought Rocky Mountain Air's 16th Gold Leaf Bi-Level Dome uh, car into service. Um, so as you can see there, um, the Bi-Level Domes were purchased uh, from a company called Colorado Rail Car. Uh, that actually built those dome cars. And the first car was delivered in 1995. There was a total car order of 16 cars, I believe. Yeah, 16 cars. Um, and the last car was delivered in 2007. So it took right around 12 years to produce those 16 cars for Rocky Mountain Air and make their way from Denver, Colorado, all the way out to the Canadian Rockies. In 2008, we actually reached our one millionth uh, guest uh, that we transported on the Rocky Mountain Air. I'm going to adjust in the timeline a bit. If you can see from when we started the company in 1990, to, it took us uh, 18, 18 years to reach uh, one million guests. And then if you go from 2008 down the timeline to 2017, which is only nine years later, we reached our two, uh, two million guests. So you can see how quickly the uh, company grew and that we doubled our guest count and the uh, and half the time uh, from our startup phase. In 2012, we launched uh, a new type of service called the Silverleaf service, <clears throat> which is just a, a level down from our gold leaf service. And what we did there is we, we took uh, the red leaf cars that were Canadian national coaches and we partnered with Alstom uh, to kind of do a refurbishment program and build what we call our single level dome. We really wanted to continue providing that curving and uh, wide open dome window uh, for our guests so that uh, we worked with Alstom to build the Silverleaf, which still allows that, but is a uh, single level car. And then in 2015 is when we launched the new U.S. route in partnership with Amtrak uh, between Seattle, Washington and Vancouver. So RTR was not actually our first venture into the United States. It's our first full train in the United States. But in 2015, we actually uh, had a route called the uh, Coastal Passage that ran from Vancouver to uh, Seattle. I believe it was a daily route. Um, and we kind of, uh, I believe, you know, I've heard from others in the company that was kind of to test the waters, I guess, if you say you will, just to see what it's like to run in the U.S. and uh, what kind of regulations were different from Canada, everything like that, as we had our, our vision, our, our strategic planning vision on, on a possible route in the U.S. Um, in 2015, in addition to launching that route, uh, we also entered into an agreement with Stadler uh, to build 10 new uh, next generation Gold Leaf cars. So uh, we have a total of, with the 16 from Colorado Rail Car, 26 uh, Gold Leaf domes. And then as you can see, uh, like we discussed, 2017, we reached 2, 2 million guests uh, on board the Rocky Mountain Air. And in 2020, our total fleet size for Silverleaf and Gold Leaf was uh, 26 Gold Leaf, 18 Silverleaf. And then, um, you know, we also have generator cars and coach cars and, and crew cars, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later on. So strategic goals. Um, as I mentioned, for 31 years, the train traveled uh, between Vancouver and the Canadian Rockies from 2014 uh, to 2019, an add-on route was operated between the Vancouver and the Seattle, uh, which was the first exploration into running a train in the United States. But the company long aspired to expand its operations and launch a new complete route somewhere else in the world. Um, it, was, uh, it was a key goal in our, our most uh, recent five-year strategic plan uh, with the uh, aim to launch the new route uh, by 2022. So when, when we were looking at new routes, uh, there was a team that was put together that surveyed different rail routes, uh, not only in the US, but in other countries as well. I believe we checked a few in Australia and, um, and Europe and I think a, a couple other countries. And from uh, what I understand, Rockies to the Red Rocks was the winner of those routes. So, uh, you know, we kind of started putting the plan down on paper and driving forward uh, with that plan. 
And then just to provide a little bit of a demographic. So when, you know, a lot of, a lot of people that I've talked to, they think uh, being that we're a Canadian company or we'll recently operated strictly in the, in Canada, that most of the ticket sales would come from Canada. But I, I really like showing this fact because um, it's just surprising to see, you know, for, you know, those 2 million guests, how it breaks down as far as percentages on where we're, we're getting those guests from. So you could see our, our largest percentage is actually from the U S and I think that was also a big driver in the decision of where we wanted to build that new uh, route and, and why the RTR here in the States was the winner is because we, we knew we had the uh, you know, the, the people per capita um, was quite large and in order to kind of uh, boost the sales. Um, but quite a few of the guests come from Australia and quite a few uh, come from the UK as well. Uh, with a small percentage coming from uh, China. And then just to kind of dive a little bit deeper into our fleet. Um, so we have 26 of the gold leaf uh, bi-level service domes, uh, 18 of the silver leaf cars, uh, two lounge cars, um, 18 crew cars, eight generator cars, and nine at this, uh, actually it's 11 locomotives because we've actually acquired two two locomotives for the the Rockies to the Red Rocks. Um, but one thing, you know, why I talk about this slide is in order to provide a, a luxury passenger service, you have to have reliable rolling stock. Um, you know, you, you really can't, uh, you know, measure a guest experience uh, if you are always breaking down or if you have a rolling stock that isn't really presentable. Um, so Rocky Mountaineer really prides itself on the, the fleet investment that it's made of about 175 million over the past five years. That includes, you know, new new purchases as well as the rehabilitation of the Silver Leaf cars. Um, all of the equipment is built to transport Canada and FRA standards. Um, if you remember from the previous map that showed the routes, uh, two of those routes passed through a, a city called Kamloops. And Kamloops is actually the uh, the maintenance facility for the entire company, and it's a key maintenance facility because with two of the routes passing through Kamloops and that being one of the destination or the midpoint destination stops, it really makes it easy from a company standpoint, a maintenance to uh, maintain the cars and service them for the next day's trip. And we've also established uh, partnerships with global leading rail companies uh, to design and build you know additional rail cars such as Alstom and Stadler. Um, Rocky Mountaineer, over its 30 years of operation, has been uh, recognized, you know, by Transport Canada, by the FRA, by certain other organizations, uh, APTA and the Shoreline Association, for uh, being leaders in uh, rail safety and security for decades. Um, I always make sure I have a piece of wood handy to say, knock on wood, in our 30 years of operation, we've never had any type of derailments. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, issues with guests falling or team members, you know, getting hurt, but any, any major incident uh, has never been part of our company history or operations. And then uh, part of our operations is uh, key industry rail partnerships uh, in Canada uh, and the U.S. that include um, Transport Canada, Railway Association of Canada, the Federal Railroad Administration, Canadian National Railway, Canadian Pacific Railway, and the uh, Union Pacific uh, Railway. How does Rocky Mountaineer operate? So we actually own the equipment only. Um, we don't own any of the infrastructure, uh, tracks, signals, um, you know, stations, any of that. How we operate is what's called track access agreements. We are very thankful for our class one partners uh, that you see here, because this has allowed us to be successful and operate for the past 30 years. Uh, so what those agreements are is we we have a you know per mile fee that we negotiate with the class ones to operate, and in that per mile fee comes uh, you know with the guarantee of uh, maintenance for the roadbed and the signals and and everything for the uh, infrastructure and the maintenance way systems, as well as dispatching. Um, so you can see here the uh, the CN uh, their self renewing evergreen track access agreements. Um, and then the uh, CP has exclusive passenger rail service between Vancouver and Banff and Vancouver and Jasper. And then our latest partner is the Union Pacific, which provides us with uh, exclusive passenger rail service between Denver and Glenwood Springs. 
and uh, Glenwood Springs and Moab. So uh, to provide a high level overview of the timing of the launch of Rockies to the Red Rocks, uh, as you can see, there was a, a long initial runway for the new route uh, with research into potential locations taking place from 2017 until early 2020. And then in March of 2020, the sudden dramatic uh, impact of the pandemic um, that forced the company to quickly put the plans on hold. However, in April of 2020, uh, leaders within the company began discussing the possibility of continuing with the planned launch even through the pandemic um, as an opportunity to diversify the company's product and the event that the, uh, the borders remain closed because of the pandemic and were unable to welcome guests from the U.S. Uh, into Canada. So with that, their, uh, the timeline kind of sped up significantly. Uh, the route was launched, uh, the decision was made to, to go forward with the route. It was launched in November of 2020, and we operated our first preview season from August 15th um, to November 18th of 2021. Um, it was an extraordinary timeline, a very tight timeline, with a great deal of work completed in a short uh, amount of time. And I just, I couldn't be more incredibly proud of the entire team uh, from, you know, not just the local team that helped launch it uh, on the ground, but uh, we couldn't do it without the support of, you know, the whole Rocky Mountaineer family in Canada supporting us, you know, marketing and sales and uh, HR, you know, everything that comes from them. It was a huge team effort to, to make it, uh, you know, successful, especially in the short amount of time that, uh, that we had. Now I'm going to start going into more of the RTR and touching on some of the highlights uh, from the preparation of the route and the operation of it. So when I was uh, talking about the track access agreements, uh, one thing I mentioned is couldn't have done it without Union Pacific. Union Pacific has been an awesome partner uh, and vital in, in our success. Uh, so the, the picture you see here, just to call out, um, some of you may know this man in the green. Uh, his name is Vic Stone. Um, he actually was part of the DC chapter of the, the NRHS because he, uh, he knew I was giving this presentation. He must have got like a, an email about it. So uh, Vic Stone's kind of the, the man with the plan, as we call him, and our guy there at Union Pacific that helped get this done. Um, and then the other uh, was our general manager that worked with Vic Stone, Dwayne Durgasoff, that helped. And, and this picture here was taken during uh, what we called our repositioning trip. So being that all the equipment was in Canada, we had to get it down to Denver. Uh, so we did that through a, uh, a special trip. You know, we brought 14 cars, uh, pieces of rolling stock total from Canada to the US. We didn't put it behind a freight train and, and get them here. We actually had a dedicated crew with a dedicated train. Um, I was part of that group. I took this picture and uh, it was a almost seven day journey it took us from uh, the border up at Idaho all the way into Denver, uh, going through crews and you know overnight stays in a hotel and such to get the train from Canada to uh, to Denver. But we you know we really do feel privileged to have great relationships with all, all of our rail partners, but Union Pacific specifically. Um, it is foundational to us for for operating all of our routes. Um, not only has UP worked with us for the main track access agreement, uh, but they've also been excellent partners in assisting us with uh, locomotive leases, uh, building leases, leases and real estate leases. We, we had nothing here in the U.S. Um, so they came in and they helped us by, you know, providing some office space for us to operate out of Denver and uh, some tracks within Denver and Glenwood Springs to store the, the consist on overnight so that we could service it or even the depot in Glenwood Springs where we you know, board and deboard our guests. We have some space in there. So UP has been great uh, other than the track access agreements to really see this project to a success and, and continues to be great in helping us be successful with it. Um, in addition, obviously to start the, the route, uh, in addition to signing the main track access agreement with Union Pacific, which was vital, um, other parts of the operation that a lot of work went into that was vital was uh, getting the, uh, the approval from the Federal Railroad Administration and the uh, Surface Transportation Board as well. So in addition to Union Pacific, the group has also worked hard to build relationships with stakeholders and other destinations of, uh, of all of our you know, key cities that we operate in, Denver, Glenwood Springs, 
and Moab uh, and to determine the best possible options for arrival and departure locations based on you know, our operational requirements, uh, the accelerated uh, launch of the timeline and, the, uh, and what's gonna be best for the experience of our guests. And this picture that you're seeing here is actually um, going down what's called the Cane Creek Branch um, that cuts away from the main line at Thompson Springs and heads toward Moab. So if any of you are rail fans that um, like to get what's called rare mileage um, as a notch in your belt, uh, this is definitely uh, an opportunity for you to get that rare mileage. Uh, we were the first passenger train ever to go down the Cane Creek branch. Uh, UP only serves freight customers, which is uh, Intrepid Potash. And then there's also the um, a government contractor that's getting rid of the tailings from the uranium mining. So we were the first passenger train and the only passenger train to head down that branch. So if you wanted about 24 miles of, uh, of rare mileage, uh, you know, definitely booking with Rocky Mountaineer and taking our, our journey uh, will definitely get you that. Um, but one, one great thing that uh, I got to call out to UP here as well that they did is, you know, the, all of the track that we operate on is uh, continuous welded rail. Other than this branch line, this was a, a jointed rail branch line. And UP actually went through and did a huge tie program prior to operations and, and replaced about, I don't know, 70 to 75 percent of the ties on the line. Uh, to ensure not only to kind of bring the, the speed up a bit, to, but to ensure that our guests uh, had a, a safe and comfortable ride um, on the jointed rail. One thing about the Cane Creek branch, too, is, is we don't go all the way into the town of Moab as our final destination. There was, uh, you know, it proved difficult to access the rail to the town of Moab. Um, so we actually, there, there's a siding that we call Seven Mile Siding um, that we stopped just outside of Moab. Uh, which is approximately about 11 miles uh, north of Moab. But even on even at that, is the, the route still provides, and the, and the Cane Creek branch in general still provides an incredible desert, uh, you know, location and landscape for our guests to board and deboard the train. Um, so while we navigated uh, some challenges with setting up the operations in the U.S. on a very tight timeline, overall we've been welcomed by all of the businesses and the destinations for providing uh, an opportunity for more guests to visit and experience the town. And by arriving and departing by train, uh, we also have a, lim a limited environmental footprint compared to the uh, same number of guests arriving by car. So not only did we have to, um, you know, bring down the equipment and bring down how we do the service as far as the operation and maintenance of the train, one of the biggest parts of, of starting this route was um, developing the services and the packages that we would offer along the route. So uh, my colleagues uh, in our onboard product and destinations teams had the significant task and undertaking of taking what you know was our world-renowned, world-class service um, that we had in Canada all these years and adapting it to our new U.S. route. Uh, this included finding uh, local suppliers, uh, such as tour operators and hotel partners, uh, to provide multi-day packages in the destinations, as well as catering partners to provide onboard culinary menus um, and, and food. And then the storytelling. One of the best things about our journeys is we have great storytelling along our train. We do a lot of research um, on all the routes to try to bring out the best in the routes and to bring out you know, not only do we give the history of maybe the rail running through the route, but a lot about the towns and what's happening in those towns and what has happened. So there was a lot of research and work that went into storytelling where the hosts um, had to gather information and historical stories um, so that we could provide those as the train travels along the route. And of course, none of this uh, would have been possible without, uh, you know, the building of an incredible team our, our onboard hosts on the train and our destination hosts, um, as well as the uh, team of mechanics and, and engineers that uh, operate the train, um, the HR team in the US, uh, they were a huge success in the startup uh, of the operation, You know, recruiting fantastic team members. Um, I got to give it to our sales and marketing team who did all the upfront work of making sure the product was you know pushed out on many platforms and you know, Joanne and her team work tirelessly to, you know, try to get as many uh, guests in the seats as possible. 
um, was, is what really led to, you know, the success of our previous season. Um, and, and all of this was, uh, despite not being able to really lean on um, Canada a lot, especially the boots on the ground teams like our onboard services and destinations, we weren't able to travel to Canada to say, well, let me, let me go see how they do it in Canada or let's go, you know, uh, do some coaching or training up there. Uh, we had to do it with closed borders. So, you know, with a few team members being able to come down from Canada and help implement the product, I think they did a really great job uh, with the limited resources and time they had to uh, match the same type of service that we offer in Canada to what is now being offered in the U.S. So now getting into, you know, that's the preparation of the route. Now the fun part was actually operating the route. Um, so we operated last year with what was called the previous season uh, that uh, went from August 15th through November 18th. Uh, we, we exceeded our initial sales targets. So our, our initial sales target, I believe, uh, was right around um, 5,000 or 5,500 guests that we were doing that previous season. And uh, we ended up with a little bit more than 7,000 guests that we ran last year in that, in that short previous season. Uh, from guest feedback, uh, I can say that the onboard experience was highly rated. Uh, the guests loved the destinations and described the scenery. Um, some of the words they used was amazing, exceptional, um, breathtaking. And we also had first-time guests interested in booking on our Canadian routes. And overall, you know, while we face the challenges due to the aggressive timeline and complexity of operating a new business in the U.S., uh, again, just had to say we we're so proud of the team for making this happen and operating our first uh, successful season here on the uh, Rockies to the Red Rocks. So now to kind of describe a little bit of the route and how it works. So um, day one, uh, so we operate two round trips per week out of Denver. The round trips start on either a Sunday or Wednesday. So day one, uh, let's say it was a Sunday, you would start off in Denver. Um, one thing that I like to really, uh, you know, tell anybody, I'm, I'm letting them know about Rocky Mountaineer and how it's that first class service is um, how the bags are handled. So one great thing is uh, when you get into Denver and you have your, you know, your first destination hotel, that day one, you come in before day one, you sleep in the hotel. On day one, you get up, you leave your bag in the hotel. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. We don't want you to worry about it. You know, we want you to enjoy your experience. So you leave your bag in the hotel and you get on the train and you go for a nice relaxing experience. Uh, we have a, a team that actually comes and works with the hotels and we'll get your luggage from your hotel. We truck it ahead of the train to your next destination hotel in Glenwood Springs. We know where you're staying. Uh, we know what room you're in. We work with the hotel to get your luggage in your room, and we also get your key for you. So when you get to Glenwood Springs on the train, before you get off the train, you're handed your key to your hotel room. So uh, imagine that experience. You've got to rest, and when you get to your destination, you don't have to worry about going to check-in. You don't have to worry about putting your luggage away before you go experience the town. You have your key, your luggage is in your hotel, and that is a first-class experience, right? So... Day one, uh, that all happens on day one from Denver to Glenwood Springs. Um, <clears throat> Glenwood Springs, we stop, uh, we, we depart Denver around uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and then we're due into Glenwood Springs around 5 p.m. Uh, get into Glenwood Springs, go to your destination hotel, uh, go enjoy the town, whatever it may be. We service the train overnight in Glenwood Springs, and then the next day uh, is a departure of 7 a.m. from Glenwood Springs. Um, and then we go on to Grand Junction where we have a small stop where we do a crew change because uh, we would run out of um, uh, hours of service on our crew. We do a small crew change in Grand Junction. Then we continue on to Moab. Uh, our arrival time into Moab is right around 1230 p.m. And, um, and that, at that point, that is the end of the journey for uh, what we call our westbound guests. Um, so when you do visit the website and you, you have the opportunity to book packages, you can book packages that include hotels on either end of the uh, destination or the train journey. And then as well as there's some options for products or packages at the end or either, either one of your destinations, uh, mostly Moab, uh, where you can you know, get some packages to tour the national parks there. 
um, or, you know, whatever it may be that, that would complete your journey. But as far as the train journey goes, it's a one-way journey uh, per guest. And so what we do is we do a turn there in Moab. So we get in at 1230 and we turn and uh, we are scheduled to leave by 230. It's a two-hour turn. And we have eastbound guests that we pick up, um, guests who started their journey in Moab and maybe they've already checked out the parks and they're ready to take a beautiful, relaxing train ride. And so then uh, we leave um, seven mile siding at 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we pick up our crew back in Grand Junction and do that crew change again. And we return all the way to Glenwood Springs with an estimated arrival time of about uh, 8 p.m. into Glenwood. Um, day three, you don't have to worry because it's not an early departure like day two was. Uh, you got to sleep in a bit because day three, we don't leave Glenwood until 9 a.m. And uh, you take a beautiful train ride back into Denver, um, where we're expected uh, into Denver about 5 p.m. And that's the end of the journey for our eastbound guests. So that would be one trip that uh, goes on Sunday. And then uh, we do the same thing Wednesday through Friday. And then Saturday is a rest train for our, our crew and our, uh, our train. Uh, total round trip is 840 miles or 420 miles one way. So now um, I will kind of go deeper into the equipment and talk about that a little bit. All right, so um, we have 14 pieces of equipment, um, 16 pieces with our locomotive uh, here in Denver on the RTR. Um, right now we do, we, for our first preview season, we leased uh, locomotives from Union Pacific. Um, here I have listed our, our locomotives that we recently uh, acquired that are actually painted in our scheme. Um, the 8020 and the 8021, there are a couple of GP40-3s, and, um, and that's, our, that's our pulling power. We don't operate um, push-pull. We operate in what we call back-to-back -back, uh, or connected mode, and then we run around the train at each destination. So whether it's in Denver or a seven-mile siding as we run around. Uh, we also have what's called the secondary crew car is our mechanical car, and our part storage car. So it, it's a secondary car to support the uh, onboard operations. Um, and we have a lounge car uh, connected with a Silverleaf coach and another lounge car with a Silverleaf coach. And then uh, seven more Silverleaf coaches here in Denver, a primary crew car, which is the primary crew car is the one that I was explaining is kind of like our, our break room, our lunch room, our train manager's office, and then our generator car to power the consist. Um, one thing I will say is uh, the lounge car and the coach car. So difference between Canada and the U.S., a big difference is you heard me talk about gold leaf and silver leaf. Um, that uh, silver leaf is offered in Canada as well as gold leaf. Um, we couldn't uh, bring the gold leaf uh, domes or cars into the U.S. because of some height restrictions through the tunnel district that we operate through on the, the mountain routes. Um, so our marketing team and our, our leadership team had to come up with a really uh, innovative way to still provide a second uh, higher end level of service than a regular coach service. So what we have for the U.S. is what's called the Silverleaf Plus package. And uh, if you buy a Silverleaf ticket, uh, your ticket you know, price includes your, your coach seat in the Silverleaf. Uh, all your meals and drinks are included on you know, day one and day two. And your midpoint uh, hotel is included in that ticket price per person. On a Silver League Plus package for the Rockies to the Red Rocks, uh, it includes all of that. Uh, and as well, it includes um, the availability to be attached to one of our lounge cars. And that's kind of that, that higher end plus package where you actually get to leave your seat and go experience a lounge car where we offer you know, some charcuterie and hors d'oeuvres. Um, higher premium alcohol and drinks, uh, which is still part of your ticket price. And, um, and that was kind of their idea to offer the, the higher service, which is my opinion has worked out great. And our guests are loving it and have a lot of comments uh, about, you know, the, the Silverleaf Plus package and how it's working here. Um, so, so that's the difference as far as Gold Leaf. Uh, we, you know, I think in the future, we will try to somehow bring Gold Leaf down. We just, um, at this point, we don't, we're not there. All right, so this is our Silverleaf cars, our coach cars. Um, so each Silverleaf car, all nine of them, they're, they're exactly the same. Uh, they seat 56 uh, seats or 56 guests in total. 
Uh, the seats do swivel. So, you know, when we get to Moab, we face them all the other way. Or if guests in between meals wanted to um, interact with other guests, we could seat them towards each other and you could, uh, you know, interact or, um, you know, play a game, whatever it may be. Um, as you can see, I put this picture here. This is me during that repositioning trip. Um, you can just see how grand those windows are, right? The viewing opportunity that you get through them uh, is just amazing on, on, on what they offer. Um, and each Silverleaf car is equipped with, uh, with two restrooms. Uh, one of them is ADA compliant. Um, and then on the other end of the car, uh, we have galleys, which, do, which we use for our, uh, our meal prep for the service on the train. Okay. Um, this next car is one of our lounge cars for the Silverleaf Plus package. Um, so this lounge car, uh, we, we, when we started the RTR, the company actually had one lounge car in Canada. We didn't have two though, and we needed to offer two levels of service. So our maintenance team in Kamloop actually stripped one of the Red Leaf cars uh, from all the old coach seating and they, you know, put up new paneling, they put new flooring in. Uh, we added some final touches in Denver, but this is, this is one of the lounge cars. It has a lot different look than the other lounge car, which you'll see in the next slide. This is more of a, a modern contemporary look for a lounge car, uh, but there's, you know, there, there's great seating in it. Um, it allows the guests to really uh, interact in a whole different way than what, you know, the coach seating provides. And uh, like I said, they're, they're a huge hit. Uh, there is a, a, each lounge car has its own restroom, so you don't have to travel back to the coach car to use the restroom as well. And then this is what we call our, our 3039 lounge car. So as you can see, uh, and the difference I was saying, this is more of a, uh, a real, you know, cozy, comfort, historical rail look for this lounge car. Um, Yes, that's right. That is a piano. And not only is that piano, that is a player piano. So it, is, uh, it plays itself. Uh, we put it on from time to time or pretty much on every trip it'll be on. And it is just, um, I tell you what, I, that's my favorite car to be in when I'm on the train with the piano playing because uh, you have a nice piano tune sitting in a lounge car, you know, with, with a great drink and you just are really enjoying uh, the art of rail and everything that it provides. It's a really great experience. Um, and then uh, one other touch I made, this lounge car came to us from Canada. And on these glasses, on the glasses you see on the far right picture uh, that accent the bar, there was maple leaves on those glasses, on those glass. And I said, we're, we don't have any maple leaves here in the US. So I chose aspen leaves and I had them remade and I think they look much better um, I don't know if our marketing team agrees with that, but I, I very much agree with it. Um, and then this is our primary crew car. So one thing you'll notice about, you know, our crew cars is, is they're not, they're not guest facing cars. So they're not going to be, you know, the same trim and fit and, and look of the materials and everything we use, but they are very functional for our crew. So you can see this is our, uh, our lunchroom, as I was talking about. So onboard hosts or mechanics who ride the train, um, when they're ready to eat or take a break, they could come back to this car. We stock plenty of snacks and food. Uh, we provide food for our, our team members as well, um, where they you know have a galley with a uh, refrigerator, microwave, uh, there's toasters and panini presses. Uh, we, we really like to take care of our team members as well, because again, you know, providing that luxury experience I talked about, not only is it, uh, is it a necessity to invest in the equipment? It's a, a necessity to invest in the employees of the team members, as we call them, because we want to make sure that they're happy so that they're providing the best experience they can to our guests. And then this is the, uh, the middle picture is the train manager's office, uh, where if you ask one of our train managers, that's where all the magic happens. And then one thing for the RTR is, you know, I talked about us not having any, any roots here in Denver. We don't have any shops or office space. So the Canadian uh, mechanical team had to get really inventive too on, um, you know, we, we still need tools. We still need parts. So they built what's called our secondary crew car or mechanical car. And on the picture on the right, you can see it's also used for some storage for our onboard team. So you'll see, 
you know, to the right, the blue bags there are their, um, their linen wear for, you know, napkins and everything like that. And they have some freezers, but uh, 60% of the car on the left picture from that door all the way down where I took the picture, that's all the storage racking uh, where we house and store uh, major parts that we need to maintain the train as well as our tools um, and then, you know, some workstations and rest stations for our team as well so that they can rest while uh, they're working, you know, on the train. Uh, we have an onboard mechanic that rides every train um, just to be attentive to any problems to ensure uh, guest comfort remains at, you know, an all-time high satisfaction while the train is operating. And then lastly, a couple pictures of our generator car. So we, we have a, a generator car. Um, and it has two generators in it. We don't run them at both times. One of them is a backup generator. Uh, we do run them equally to make sure we get enough hours on them. Uh, but again, you know, the, uh, the one in the green is recently acquired and new. We wanted to make sure we had a strong gen for this operation. And the one on the left, uh, I recently just had an in-frame overhaul done this year. So even if the, uh, the car, you know, is an older car, we make sure that the operating equipment um, that is feeding the system, the infrastructure, the bones of our equipment are uh, up to a reliable standard. And so what's next is, well, what's current right now is uh, operating our 2022 season. So um, unlike 2021, which was a previous season, uh, we're at, this is our first full year season where we started uh, in April of uh, this year and we will run through the end of October. And, and that's kind of going to be our our running pattern, uh, you know, from here on forth. And then um, I would hope, and I think there is uh, plans for expansion within the U.S. You know, the, this is a very successful route. There's a lot, a lot of other routes and track mileage in the U.S. that is uh, exceptional for viewing. And I think, um, you know, Rocky Mountaineer uh, is, is looking at that and uh, seeing what is, you know, next for the U.S. and, and definitely wants to expand um, in the U.S. market. So next is going to be a video that's playing um, that I'd like you to watch. As you drift away from the lively city of Denver, the sun wakes the Colorado Rockies, and you begin your journey through landscapes that have been transformed over millennia. And it feels as though it was all created just for you. Roaming through breathtaking plains, you reach an engineering marvel known as the Big Ten Curve. Relax in comfort as you cut through six miles of hand-blasted rock in the historic Moffat Tunnel, where you cross the Continental Divide. Take in majestic canyons slowly carved away by the Colorado River on its long march to the Pacific Ocean. As you travel along tracks stitched into towering red canyons, indulge in world-class service from our glass dome coaches. Wind along endless captivating canyon walls before arriving at the historic town of Glenwood Springs famous for its geothermal amenities. Begin your day exploring the monumental Debec Canyon, part of Grand Mesa, the world's largest flat-top mountain. Then witness the glory of Mount Garfield, standing proudly at over 6,700 feet. It's sure to be a high point. The surreal beauty of the crimson stained cliffs surrounds you displaying millions of years of erosion as you cross Ruby Canyon. Finally, you approach Moab, as the red sandstone mountains that the American Southwest is so famous for come into view. This is your gateway to the mighty five national parks. From the Rockies to the Red Rocks, this ever-changing journey captures the unimaginable majesty of this unique place that's been a million years in the making.
So lastly, um, you know, thank you all. And I just wanted to make sure um, that if you uh, wanted to find out more information or had any questions, you know, after this uh, presentation or any that, you know, you don't remember to ask tonight, um, this is just some contact info for uh, myself or Ina, um, who's our sales director for the Rockies to the Red Rocks. You can reach out to either her or myself at any time, or you can go to our website at www.rockymountaineer for further information as well. Hi, Carl. Thank, thank you for all that information. I just thought I would interject a little bit of, of information about what it's like on board the train, because you saw some great photos as uh, well as the video showing guests on the train. And every guest has an assigned seat in an assigned uh, car. So uh, they do not go between cars. Uh, they are safe and secure in their own car. The exception to that is going into a lounge car, if which is adjacent to your silver leaf coach. If uh, you have uh, you know, purchased that kind of a package. So uh, all the meals are included, all the beverages, including alcoholic beverages. And whether you're in Canada or the US, uh, the food is designed around uh, the destinations that you're traveling in. So you have a little bit of a Southwest flair on Rockies to the Red Rocks. Uh, Canadian food is quite a bit different. Uh, we source our wines from Palisades, a lot of them, uh, as much as we can on the US route. Uh, so we try and uh, as much as we can sort of immerse people in, into the destination, even when they're on traveling by the train. So, um, and you also notice that the seats look very comfortable. They recline, uh, they have foot rests, um, and people don't stay in their seats all the time. It becomes very social. You get to know the other members uh, of the coach that, you're, that are traveling with you. And uh, also because all of our uh, hosts on board are might, if anyone on the, on the train spots any wildlife, Everyone in the concept, consist instantly knows about it. And so everybody's going to be running to that side of the train to get their photos, right? So uh, they also tell you ahead of time if they're going to be coming up to an area where uh, they think you might want to take photographs so you can get prepared. So it's just a really fun experience uh, that we try and take the hassle out of train travel and just make it you know, relaxing for our guests on board where they can just really enjoy the sightseeing and uh, the camaraderie of, of being with this wonderful group of people that they're probably traveling with. So anyway, uh, any questions for any of us? Well, we do have a couple. Um, I'll follow up with, with something that you've just said uh, at this point in time. Um, it, it, Earlier in the discussion, there was a question about the gathering stories. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that there's a mic'd person on each of the cars. Tell us more about what the stories are. Yeah, so the stories are really terrific. So uh, the stories will vary depending on your day on the train because they will uh, evolve around the geography that you're looking at. Uh, the history of the area that you're going through, maybe uh, some of the stories about the first settlers of the area or what the towns are all about, you know, how they grew, how they were started, how they grew up, you know, that kind of thing. So think of it as sightseeing on a train instead of a motor coach. It's like a stagecoach, except you're on a train. Yes. <laughs> 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 well, now, well now, now turning to a little bit of the, the equipment, we had a question about your own locomotives and, and why not equip them with head end power and dispense with the generator cars. And one of our person uh, answered that they were originally freight engines, so there wasn't any space for the HEP generators. But, but uh, I'd like to get Carl's take on, on this question. Yeah, I think Edward answered that uh, perfectly, and that's what it is, right? They're, the GP38s were freight locomotives. They don't have the room for it. Usually, HEPs were in your other, you know, E8s or E9s or or even, uh, you know, F40 locomotives. 
Um, but we don't have those, you know, streamlined passenger locomotives. We are operating with more of a freight locomotive, and there's no room for head end power. Um, it is something that I keep my eye on. I, I think I would love to operate, you know, some streamlined passenger uh, locomotives. And if I did, I, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ensure that there was an operating HEP system uh, to power the train. I uh, would probably still. Even if I had that, I'd still keep my gen car and drag it along because, you know, you always want to make sure you have some uh, backup plan. Um, but uh, primarily, I would use the HEP if I did have it available to me. Mm, okay, great. Thank you. Well, those are all the questions that we had at this time. But I want to take a, a moment and get some personal uh, uh, information from you both. So I'm going to ask a question both to Carl and Joanne and you can each answer the same or different. You know, many of us who travel by rail uh, and go to railroad uh, meetings, they're always a memorable set of, of parts of the track that are just fantastic. And people really talk about it and have stories to tell as railroaders to, each, to other railroaders about a certain mile point on the track. Um, so, Carl, let me start with you. Do you have a favorite spot in in the your U.S. operations? You know, I I, I do. I, well, I kind of have two favorites. It's hard for me to. It's like picking between my children. But you know, there, there's probably twelve to fifteen iconic you know spots, canyons we go through, and there's two that I you know has a toss up for me on. First one is. Because I'm from Colorado, right? And I'm from the Rockies. I've been through a lot of mountains. The first time I went through Ruby Canyon, uh, which is one of the slides you saw, I was amazed because I had never seen that type of scenery before. You can't get that in the Rocky Mountains. So I would say probably Ruby Canyon is one of them. And maybe I'm just attracted to like Red Rocks because my other favorite is Burns Canyon. Um, you know, Gore Canyon and some of the really high canyon walls, you know, extreme water through them, they're beautiful. But there's something about Ruby Canyon and Burns Canyon that have Burns Canyon. What I love about it is you have that red rock um, and you wouldn't think it just pops out of nowhere. You have green scenery, high mountain activity, and then you have this like red rock coming through, but a bunch of pine trees. It's a lot different than Ruby Canyon where you don't have pine trees. But in, in Burns Canyon, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And then it's it stepped and, and the way that it's eroded away, um, I would have to say Burns Canyon or Ruby Canyon are my favorite spots where when I pass through them, I stop what I'm doing and I make sure every time to enjoy uh, the beautiful gift that we were given in that scenery. Great, thank you. How about you, Joanne? Oh, you know, those are a couple of my favorites too, but I also like the Glenwood Canyon. But I think that... One of the things that's so attractive about this particular route is that it changes all the time. So I really also enjoy, there's an area you go through, and I don't know the miles, mile markers, but uh, it's between Glenwood Springs and Denver, where you go through these very pastoral scenes where you see these little tiny farms and these, you know, and these little tiny ranches, and you think, oh my gosh, what must, must it be like for them in the winter, but in the and, you know, during the season when we travel there, it's just glorious to me. It's just so green with the water running through it and the animals. I, I, I just really enjoy it. Great. Thank you. And, and that brought up a question um, from John that that it, about seasonal travel. So your season in the United States is is what? Remind me. Yes, yeah, the same. Um both countries. So uh, it's uh, late April through the end of October. And it's, we, we are seasonal only because in the winter time, we just lose so much daylight. So it would defeat the purpose of our all daylight travel when, you know, you don't have as many hours of daylight, you know, in the winter time. Okay. And John was asking about uh, the Canadian side of the business. I mean, you've been talking about the American Rocky Mountaineer um, but there must be some wonderful uh, trips through the Canadian Rockies. So do you, does your Canadian counterpart, Canadian Rocky Mountaineer, do they run all year? No, it's the same, same time schedule as in the United States for the okay. same. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. 
Yeah. That, well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, I, for one, am really looking forward to learning more about this. I mean, I, I think that the pictures that you have shown and the, the iconic Western landscapes are just incredible, just incredible. So thank you for those, so those glimpses. So one of the things that will remind our audience is that all of these meetings are uploaded to our DC and our HS YouTube channel. So they're recorded and Garen does a fabulous job in editing them. Um, and so if you wanna see this presentation again or refer it to your friends and neighbors, it's available on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe for all of our updates. Can I make so, one comment? Sure. Yeah, we have, we have um, uh, salespeople scattered throughout the country and they're always available to do a presentation uh, to, to groups in person as well. So uh, you could just reach out to us and we're happy to set that up. Great, thank you. So we're gonna close with thanking uh, Carl and Joanne for their wonderful presentation today. You've got a number of us all excited about figuring out how we can get all the money to, to take this ride. So wonderful time. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Joanne. And thank, thank you. you all for joining us on this terrific evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us.